Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. I cannot believe my eyes. Is Bankrupt FTX Exchange looking for a comeback? This coming from Tim on Twitter here. Apparently they are. They're looking for a comeback in quarter two of 2023. So, I mean, not even a year since they collapsed and uh, they're already looking to come back as previously reported by CoinGate. In an effort to reclaim value for creditors and consumers, new FTX CEO John J. Ray III has declared his intention to investigate the possibility of relaunching FTX.com. Yes, you are reading that right. The company's primary international exchange. Even though Ray, who has spent years rehabilitating and driving firms like Enron through their tumultuous bankruptcy process, uh, has labeled FTX as the biggest failure of corporate governance in his professional time span. So FTX bigger than even Enron. Moreover, Ray claims that despite the fact that top executives at FTX have been charged with illegal activity, a multitude of customers have commended the company's technology and proposed there might be some merit in rebooting the platform. Now, I mean, I got to just ask, uh, you know, people who may have used FTX, if you guys uh, did use FTX and you are watching this video, would you ever use them again if, uh, you know, Sam Bankman-Fried and his array of sociopathic friends were not working it anymore? Um, it's a good question because, I mean, if the technology is sound, the technology is sound. And if it's being run by someone else, John J. Ray III, um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Tell me down in the comments what you guys think. And yeah, I guess the other question is, in what kind of capacity? Uh, it is not known at this time if the management team at FTX will eventually proceed in reinstating the exchange. Things still are remaining blurred, but, uh, you know, this is just murmurings now that we're hearing because they have uh, recouped some funds. Anyway, thought this was an interesting story. Crypto related, wanted to thank Tim for posting that. Also happened to see this, guys, from Thunes. Ripple partner Thunes secures new license in France. And so they're going to be launching a global payout solution across the European Union. Ripple partner Thunes, a global cross-border payments company, has been granted the new payment institution license by the financial authority in France, uh, which will enable the company to send payments worldwide on behalf of its French and EU customers and partners. Thunes can now offer global cross-border payment services to non-bank financial institutions in the EU, including companies without a payment license. So it uh, looks like uh, Thunes is a step ahead of their competition, at least in uh, this region of the world. The latest regulatory approval in France complements Thunes' existing license, allowing the company to conduct payment acquisition services for merchants, marketplaces, and payment service providers for regulated financial institutions in the region. Uh, with the new license, Thunes can accelerate its expansion by onboarding new companies of all sizes in the EU and opening additional avenues for various use cases. So this gives them a lot of flexibility. Again, keeping them one step ahead of their competition. And uh, I mean, I guess they have the confidence because they are a Ripple enabled company leveraging DLT technology to make this all happen. Here's a quote. It is a significant milestone, not only for Thunes, but also for our customers as we're extending our license coverage and transforming into a major payment powerhouse connecting Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East and Latin America. So boom, there's where it is covering all these regions of the world. Uh, so they're saying we can play a critical role in helping ambitious European fintechs and aspiring global innovators expand their research to new cross-border markets. So guys, this license, uh, it's, it does sound as though that this is really going to help Ripple-enabled Thunes quite a bit expand into many different regions of the world. And how many continents uh, will that cover? Europe, Asia, Africa, so three continents officially, uh, and then the Middle East and Latin America, other regions of the world that aren't technically continents, but uh, very significant regions nonetheless. Anyway, some interesting news there coming from Ripple partner Thunes. The Wrath of Kahneman here letting us in on another Ripple partner connection. This one has to do with RIA Money. So this is a merger that is occurring in the UK and Ireland. UK and Ireland country manager at RIA, a business segment of Euronet Worldwide and leading cross-border money transfer firm, uh, says 2019 is witnessing a consolidation of that firm. Uh, here's what's happening, guys. Uh, 2023 is witnessing a consolidation of that trend with investments in digitization starting to yield fruit. What we built three years ago is now paying off. This is what he said in an interview. He pointed to the onboarding of more locations in West Africa as one of the highlights for the firms as it looks to simplify remittances in the UK to emerging markets in Guinea and Sierra Leone. Uh, here's a quote. Sierra Leone is now in our top 10 list of recipients receiving money through our digital service with customers in the UK sending money using the app for cash payouts. So more uh, opportunity for remittances moving into Africa. Uh, you know, we've heard about the flutter waves and the uh, MFS Africa within Africa for, uh, you know, to provide on-demand liquidity within the African continent. But there's also remittance flows moving into Africa. And it looks as though RIA Money, another Ripple partner, is adding to this benefit here. Uh, the African continent in general holds great promise. He 
further said, referring to the region as the next big thing. So something else that I've talked about on this channel uh, in the global remittance market due in part to increasingly large populations receiving funds from abroad and more money being transferred between neighboring countries. So again, just going back to that MFS Africa connection and the ODL infrastructure that has recently been put into Africa. When it comes to balancing in-person and digital remittances, he says both are growing in parallel as some customers still prefer open face-to-face -face interaction with agents. So, you know, there's always going to be that facet of people that, uh, you know, do not want to touch digital money transfers. They still want to go into, uh, you know, or, or, or at least they don't want to do them uh, without a person behind a counter. They still want to go into a brick and mortar location and, uh, you know, do it the old school way. I totally get that. However, uh, you know, that generation is slowly sunsetting and uh, you know, a new generation of people are going to be the ones who are going to be performing more and more of these transactions as the years go on. So, you know, going digital is a no brainer. Africa, obviously, I mean, in my opinion, probably the most, if not one of the most important uh, markets for this emerging technology. And we're seeing Ria Money here, a Ripple partner, already working to help towards that goal. So, great news here. Wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman for posting that. Caitlin Long, guys, on Twitter mentioning this with regards to FedNow and this ongoing controversy surrounding central bank digital currencies in the United States. It looks like we are in full damage control now. Um, I was thinking that, you know, people's Worries would subside after FedNow initially released that statement a few days ago, but guys, they had to put out another statement. This one just from 21 hours ago, Caitlin Long mentioning this. Wow, the Fed is really playing defense about FedNow amid the sudden surge of critics. The Fed released a new thread today. I agree, FedNow is not a CBDC, so uh, they were being criticized by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And uh, I think it was, yeah, it was uh, DeSantis as well suggesting that, you know, a central bank digital currency will kill so much in America, uh, freedoms, liberties, all that stuff. Uh, FedNow had, had to come out and basically state, okay, this is not a CBDC, we're just a payment provider. And, you know, so there was a bit of a confusion, but also the critics were relentless. And now they had to release this. Okay, another statement, is FedNow replacing cash? Is it a central bank digital currency? And they said, no, FedNow is not related to a digital currency. FedNow is a payment service from the Federal Reserve and it's making it available to banks and credit unions. As we know, I mean, it is not a uh, central bank digital currency. However, I think the distinction that a lot of people still want to hear from them is that they will not issue a central bank digital currency. And at least if they do issue a central bank digital currency, it will in fact still have privacy features uh, similar to using cash. The FedNow service is neither a form of currency nor a step towards eliminating any form of payment, including cash. So they, they're stating this flat out. Uh, the FedNow service is an instant payment service provided by the Federal Reserve, and it's launching in July. FedNow will be available to depository institutions such as banks and credit unions in the U.S. and will enable individuals and businesses to send instant payments through their depository institution accounts. Instant payments allow individuals and businesses to send and receive payments within seconds at any time of the day uh, on any day of the year so that the receiver of a payment can use the funds almost instantly. Testifying before the House Financial Services Committee in March, Powell said a central bank digital currency is something we would certainly need congressional approval for. So they are even, you know, quoting Jerome Powell on this and really wanting to differentiate between a central bank digital currency and the FedNow platform. Learn more about FedNow here. And so uh, you can take a look at these links. If you guys are interested, I will link this in the description of the video. And many people hopping in on this thread, uh, as you guys can see. So uh, a very vibrant thread. Oh, wow. Look at that. Frog boiling us. Um, you guys probably know what that term means. Uh, so again, I will link this in the description if you guys want to jump in on the conversation. But you know, FedNow and central bank digital currencies, they do not have a lack of critics. From Tulsi Gabbard here on Fox News, listen to this. Now we have in Europe this threshold above 1,000 euros, you cannot pay cash. If you do, you're on the gray market. So you take mm -hmm. your risk. You get caught you are fined or you go in jail. So you go to jail for spending your own money if they don't control it. That's coming here. Tulsi Gabbard has spoken out against it. She, of course, ran for president, served in the House from Hawaii, and joins us now. Congressman, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Tucker. Do, do, this is so dystopian. You'd hate to think it could ever come here. You think it might. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, this is just the latest effort by those in power in our country who are intent on undermining and taking away our own freedoms and liberties. This, this central bank digital currency is about government sanctioned surveillance 
and control. It's about them being able to keep track of every single thing that we purchase, whether it's a stick of gum or an automobile or anything in between. And so if they have all this inf information and data, which they will in this system, then where does that lead? It gives them the power to decide, okay, well, hey, we don't want to allow you to purchase certain things or we may deem it necessary to, to freeze your overall account. Uh, this power and, and what they can do with it, it's not something we have to imagine. We've already seen how Democrats in Congress, Elizabeth Warren and others, are pressuring credit card companies to code and keep track of any purchase that's made at a store that sells firearms. Why? So that these private companies can then say, hey, this person is purchasing, I don't know what, what they deem is kind of the threshold, but there's, they will then report that as suspicious activity to law enforcement and then expect law enforcement to take action and go after the purchases, legal, legal purchases that a private person made. So this all comes back to, to how you open this. Once we give up our economic autonomy, we no longer have freedom. Once we allow someone else to control our wallet, they then control our freedom. Do you think people understand what this means? It'll be sold, as always, as an effort to push back against terrorism or international financiers or crime or whatever. But do, do people understand on a gut level what, what could be coming? Uh, I, I don't think they do. And, and it's understandable because if you listen to what the government is telling us, like with all of these other things, whether it's the Patriot Act or the Restrict Act, they're doing the very same thing with this, saying, hey, this is for your own good. This is for your convenience, to make it easier for you to conduct transactions uh, when, in fact, they are giving themselves all of the power, uh, taking it away from us, undermining our God-given rights and freedoms in the Constitution uh, because they want to be able to control us. They want to be able to control we the people. And the clip basically ends there. So central bank digital currencies bringing about a cashless society. Guys, we're not there yet. However, the Fed in damage control and, uh, you know, we've got critics like Tulsi Gabbard, also pointing out some of these things about privacy uh, and liberties. So uh, I thought that was a great clip just to kind of compliment what is going on in uh, the United States specifically, Fed now having a hard time. And not only that, we've got Christy Noam of South Dakota, guys. She just vetoed a bill that would have established a central bank digital currency as a legitimate form of money without, get this, without recognizing other assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Well played. I got to say, well played at this moment in time, such a government backed economic currency has not yet been created. More importantly, South Dakota should not open the door to a potential future overreach by federal government. So this is Bill 1193, and it's defined as the medium of exchange that is currently authorized or adopted by a domestic or foreign government. Interestingly, the bill appeared to garner quite a bit of attention. And what Noam is basically stating here is, look, we'll take a central bank digital currency, but... You also have to acknowledge Bitcoin and Ethereum. Those are the two examples she gave uh, in the bill. Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, and we should be able to use those as currencies as well. I think that's a great compromise. Um, but you think government will go for it? Absolutely not. In many ways, it can be argued that Noam, by vetoing the bill, is giving crypto a much larger chance at life, not just in South Dakota, but in the country. The idea of a central bank digital currency is a scary one because it brings into the picture something that crypto was never supposed to fall victim to, third party and or federal control. Guys, this is getting so much pushback now. I really do wonder how, uh, you know, the powers that be are going to handle uh, what is going on here in the United States. The United States has a great grasp, I think, on, uh, you know, pushing back on this uh, more so, definitely more so than Europe and Canada, where I think there definitely needs to be monumental change at a higher level. Um, but, you know, you got governors, you got members of Congress fighting back on this, like Christy Nome in South Dakota. So this is a great article. Wanted to thank Michael just for posting that. However, with CBDCs, will come an inflow of instant volume. Think about this concept of Fed now and how some are suggesting that, you know, you implement brand new technology that would uh, modernize payments, that would make payments instant. Well, think about the implications of that and not just the positive implications, think of the negative implications. Think of a run on the banks and how much faster that could happen. So guys, all this runs both ways. And although we've got naysayers and Riddler deniers, saying that XRP is not going to move all the money. And I mean, full disclosure, even I don't think it'll move literally every single dollar on planet Earth. I think that that is uh, just an unrealistic expectation. 
It's great when we unearth clips like this, guys. I think this was from 2018 or 2019. Watch Marcus Trecher, okay? Former Senior Vice President of Customer Success at Ripple. At this time, he was working for Ripple. He mentions blockchains on the Interledger protocol theoretically can have infinite volume. Plus, the liquidity model of XRP was created to serve 7 to 9 billion people. In other words... All the money, listen to this. We configured our technology in a way that really fixed the problem of cross-border payment stability very, very well. So for the cross-border payment challenge, we created an open internet model. We called the idea Interledger. So Interledger, like the internet, supports our Ripple technology globally. And that model does not require a single universal common blockchain. It requires a very open blockchain interconnectivity. And that means that the volume is theoretically infinite. It's like the, internet. the internet never runs out of um, capacity. Elements do, but the internet still works because it's inherently decentralized. So Ripple is the same. So we have a decentralized model, which is infinitely scalable. Supporting that, we have our liquidity proposition, which uses XRP, and that's a classic blockchain. But XRP was designed from the outset for transacting. So unlike likes of Bitcoin, which is like very slow and slows down as you, as you continue to build on volume, the XRP model is very, very, very high speed and very high capacity. So the liquidity part is very adequately served by the XRP model. The wider network we're creating, where if you're really going to create something of value for the 7 billion people in the world or 9 billion by 2050, you've got to have a very open internet type model. And that's what we have with our ex-current Ripple Net model. So if you need to serve 7 billion or maybe 9 billion by the year 20, I think he said 2050, you have to have this flexibility and XRP can serve those 9 billion people by the year 2050, guys, the liquidity model was created specifically for this. XRP was created to scale and the interledger theoretically has infinite volume. So when we talk about all the money, yes, XRP will not serve literally every single dollar and every single thing of value on planet Earth. However, it is meant to handle a hell of a lot. That's just my opinion. But I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.